Welcome and thank you for coming to our virtual author talk with Rick Carlin on Paper Cuts, My Life in Chicago's Volatile LGBTQ Press. I'm excited to introduce author Rick Carlin um, and historian Owen Keenan, who's going to be leading the Q&A with Rick after his reading. A uh, brief bio is Rick Carlin was inducted into Chicago's LGBT Hall of Fame in 1997 in recognition of his career in Chicago's LGBT press with Gay Life Newspaper, Gay Chicago Magazine, Outlines, Nightlines, Chicago Free Press, and Boy Magazine. He now serves as co-chair on the board of uh, Friends of LGBT Hall of Fame. His memoir, Paper Cuts, My Life in Chicago's Volatile LGBTQ Press, was published by Rattling Good Yarns Press in 2019. He's also a playwright and a novelist. Um, he's semi-retired and living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he serves on the board of Island City Stage, Florida, South Florida's only LGBT theater company. Um, and he's also married to fellow Hall of Fame inductee, Greg Shapiro. Um, and then Owen Keenan is the author of several fiction and nonfiction titles, his most recent being Dugan's Bistro and The Legend of the Bearded Lady. He's the co-founder of the Legacy Project, which is a history education organization focused on reclaiming and celebrating our LGBTQ past. Um, his current writing projects include A Place for Us, LGBTQ Life at the Belmont Rocks, about the importance of this queer space and the development of Chicago's LGBTQ community, as well as an overview of drag performers in Chicago from the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, so Rick is going to start us off with a reading. Um, and again, I will paste a link for where to purchase the book in the chat box. So go ahead and take it away, Rick. I'll go ahead and unmute Rick. There you go. In his extensive history of the LGBT press, <clears throat> excuse me, Unspeakable, the rise of the gay and lesbian press in America, Roger Stripe Matter stated, reading gay publications has served as the first tenuous step for men and women embarking on the very personal and often profoundly difficult journey toward acknowledging their homosexuality to themselves and the world around them. That proved especially true for me. The LGBT press provided the opportunity for me to take those first tenuous steps made easier because I knew I was not alone. I married quite young and soon afterwards I realized I was gay. I decided to tell my wife, but before I could do so, she told me she was pregnant. We tried, I tried to make a go of it, but eventually came out. Gay Life newspaper was my only connection to the gay community. Not long after my wife and I separated, there was an ad in the classified section for the gay life of gay life for a gay parents rap group. I joined and soon became co-leader of the group. I was responsible for submitting the classified ad in the paper each week. The ads were free, but had to be mailed to or dropped off at Gay Life's downtown office every week. When I walked in, I expected the office to look like a scene from the movie, The Front Page. People running around and handing deadlines to each other. Um, instead, I entered a dreary looking office space and was greeted by a woman who looked like a heavier version of Janice Joplin. She stopped her furious typing long enough to take the three by five cards with the parents group information and drop it in a wire basket with dozens of others. That scene repeated itself for a few months. Eventually, she was joined at an adjoining desk by a thin man with an enormous mustache. As the months went by, I worked up the courage to speak to them and learned that their names were Sarah Craig and Steve Kulicki, the editors of the paper, and both members of Chicago's LGBT Hall of Fame. One day, I mentioned to them that I enjoyed some cooking columns they'd run. Sarah said the writer of that column had left town and asked me if I would like to take over. I was a product of the Chicago public school system and had never written anything more than a few essays in English class. Could I write? I didn't know. Since I didn't know what else to say, I told them I'd try and would bring them a column soon. The recipes part of the assignment didn't faze me. I'd been interested in cooking ever since I was a child. And when my son was born, I dropped out of college 
and managed to talk my way into a job at one of the city's most popular restaurants where I worked my way up from line cook to sous chef in less than a year. Riding the subway home the evening after the offer from Gay Life, I took out a notepad and began to list possible topics for a column. I returned the next day with a column about hosting a party called Out of the Kitchen and Into the Party. As I handed the typewritten sheets to Sarah, we handed in real paper then. I was so nervous that my hand was shaking. I stood in front of her waiting for a response. It never occurred to me that she might have something more important to do. Seeing me standing there, she read the column and started laughing. She handed it over to Steve, who also chuckled a few times. Thanks, we'll run it, was all he said. Sarah added, deadlines are Monday, and then added, what do you want to call it? There was a TV chef at the time known as the Galloping Gourmet, so I offered the Gay Gourmet. On June 22nd, 1979, Gay Life ran my first Gay Gourmet column. That led to others. And eventually I moved from Gay Life to Gay Chicago Magazine and from food editor to entertainment editor. And that's sort of my intro into Chicago's LGBT press. That's great. So I don't know, Owen, do you want to start us off with a couple questions for Rick? And then, you know, if you're in the audience and have questions, start typing them over to me, or you can virtually raise your hand during the Q&A. Uh, well, first of all, I just love how, how much fate enters into the story, how you got involved with uh, Chicago's LGBTQ press. Um, I want to know, though, what made this the right time to write about it? What made this the right time to tell your story? Well, when I started it four or five years ago, mm -hmm. there were only a few people left from the early days of the LGBTQ press still working in the gay press. Uh, there was Bill Kelly, Marie Kuda, um, Tracy Bame came a little bit later, um, and she's still working in the press, although she's now with the reader. Um, and Bill Williams, or Albert Williams, as he's known, uh, was also one. But people were dying off. There weren't very many of us left. And I felt I had to tell at least my version of the story. And it is only my version. It's what I remember, how I remember it, um, and the experiences I had. And I felt that the, the story of Chicago's gay press was interesting enough on its own that it needed to be told by somebody. Oh, sure, and, and it is. It's a, it's a fascinating story, but when I knew about things from a distance, but your book really takes you sort of into the, the whole situation. Um, with a book like this, I was wondering what you wanted to convey about Chicago's LGBTQ press at the time during your, your uh, work with the press? Well, it was definitely um, a work where you had to love what you were doing. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, a, there was no money in it. There still is no money in it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm working for the gay press down here in Fort Lauderdale and I'm making only double what I made 35 years ago when I started at Gay Chicago, which, is hundreds of times more than I got at Gay Life because I was never paid anything. <laughs> but it was um, it was it was a labor of love for everybody, and um, there was fierce loyalties, and there was backstabbing, and there was um, machinations, and it was it was truly a, a really wonderful exciting thing to be involved in. Did, a, um, did the manuscript change at all as it progressed? Did you find yourself dwelling more on certain things? Did you have as much idea of how much you would balance personal and professional when you started? Um, well, the, when I first, well, when I first did it, it was a fictional piece. 
Because oh. I figured that way I couldn't get sued. I could change <laughs> the names of everybody and I would never get sued. Um, so that, uh, you know, um, but then when I decided, my husband said, I think it needs to be a memoir. And so when I started making a memoir, the first draft, I gave it to a few friends to read and they were all like, well, this sounds like wonderful reporting, but there's no you in it. And what I had done is I had stepped back into reporter mode and was told the who, what, where, when, and why, um, and sometimes the how, but not my own personal part of it. Mm -hmm. And also the whole part about being a gay man, raising a child, uh, in the 1970s through not 2000s, um, which was very, uh, on its own, very unusual. Mm -hmm. And then trying to do that and balance working a regular job teaching and being uh, working with the gay press. Um, I still, I look back now and I don't know how I did it all. Um, but I was a lot skinnier then, so it probably wore a lot of a lot of pounds off of me. Um, but yeah, it did. It changed a lot. It became much. There's a lot more personal stuff in the book now. Okay. Before. Was any part of it more difficult to write about than anything else? Um, writing about people I lost, whether I lost them to AIDS or due to a misunderstanding of, you know, <laughs> some sort of break in the friendship. Those were difficult to write about. Mm -hmm. um, and there, uh, that was really, really difficult. And the hard, one of the really hard parts was trying to make sure that I was being as fair to everybody as I could be. Um, and still report things from my perspective. Sure. So, um, you know, there was, uh, I hope I got, I got to that point. Um, you know, especially when you're talking about somebody as mercurial as Jeff McCourt, who was the publisher, the original publisher of Windy City Times, uh, dealing with Jeff was, was a hard thing because we were very good friends. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were also uh, competitors because I, I, although I wrote a few things under the table for him, I never officially worked for Windy City Times. Mm -hmm. Something about your career that, um, that I find really interesting too is, is that you started um, in the queer presses in 1979. So you started sort of pre-AIDS era how did the epidemic sort of change the face of queer journalism, in your opinion? Oh, my goodness. Um, so much. First of all, it, it politicized it. Sure. Even to a greater extent than it was. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who were originally much more mainstream in their approach to things realized that we needed to be a little bit more forceful and to speak out a lot more to get what we needed mm -hmm. because the government wasn't going to do anything about it. Um, so that was part of it. Um, and then there's the whole economic part of it where, um, I don't know if you want to get into that now because you did mention we were going to talk about the, well, use it as a segue. As, I'll use it as a segue. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the things that happened um, at this time was one of our strangest allies for actually helping the gay press was Ronald Reagan with his deregulation of AT&T. So tell me about that. Yes. So uh, although Reagan, you know, was horrible when it came to issues on AIDS, he was really instrumental in the growth of the gay and lesbian press in the 1980s. It was a combination of 
the deregulation of AT&T, which for anybody that was around that time, that meant that there were all these new phone lines and there were phone sex lines that were popping up everywhere. And the only overhead these companies had other than paying for their phone line was advertising. And so there were people that owned seven or eight different phone sex lines and they would have different ads. They'd have one geared to the leather community one geared towards, you know, Jim Bob bunnies and things like that. So they were very kind of specific in, in their target demographic. And they would take out full page ads in the gay press. And I'm talking, you know, the, when the newspapers were tabloid size, the great big, huge ones. And so if you can imagine a Chicago Tribune size ad and you have 30 or 40 of those being placed every week, suddenly the gay press had the money to hire writers to go and use color photography, use color printing. And that combined with the advances in printing and word processing all made gay presses just thrive. And so, and part of the reason the sex lines were so popular was because of fear of AIDS is people were like, well, I certainly can't get AIDS if I'm just talking on the phone. So they would do phone sex things. Um, and it's only $1.99 a minute. Yeah, $1.99 <laughs> a minute. I'll tell you, I remember my son called one of those lines and fell asleep and ooh, I got the phone bill and it was like $853 because he had left the phone off the hook oh, no. for hours with it. Um, luckily, I didn't have to pay it because he was a minor and he wasn't supposed to be on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so Gay Life, Gay Chicago, Outlines, Nightlines, Chicago Free Press. Um, you freelanced for Windy City Times. Um, you were a, a voice on uh, Les by Gay Radio. What's, what do you think is the most important thing that you had to survive in the sort of volatile world of Chicago LGBTQ publishing? Well, two things. One is I knew when to keep my mouth shut, uh, which people who know me would be surprised that that's true, but I did. Um, you know, one of the things I did when I moved over to Gay Chicago and it continued at gay, uh, outlines, nightlines, um, was I wrote a gossip column. And the gossip column at Gay Chicago was the most popular thing. It was the first thing everybody turned to. And I wrote it under a fake name, but everybody knew it was me. Yeah, you know, my, my name, my picture in, was there at first. And then we switched to, I wrote it under a pseudonym, which was pseudonym, not very <laughs> subtle. Um, but we, um, and a lot of what I put in there was just press release information that, you know, you could, that if you went to the bar's ad and said, oh, we now have a big screen TV. So I would put, you know, oh, guess who's got a big screen TV now, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, you know, all that. And I'd make it sound like you were getting the scoop. But it was the same stuff that was in press releases and ads. I just made it sound a little bit more interesting. You mastered yeah. the tone. Yes, tone. It was all tone. And it was all, you know, I, I had never even read Walter Winchell. But I didn't realize that I was writing in Walter Winchell style because I'd write a sentence with an ellipse and then another sentence of something completely unrelated about another <laughs> item. And I, years later, learned that's what Walter Winchell did. So people I were know. like, oh, you were you were imitating Walter Winchell. No, I, I didn't <laughs> even know who he was when I did it. Um, I wish I could nod and say, oh, yes, yes, I'm very wise. I knew, you know, I knew all that, but I didn't. I just, yeah, I did it because that way I didn't have to have a through line. I could just throw in comments anywhere and add them as needed be 
Um, what um, what did you get in the most trouble for as a gossip columnist? Well, um, one thing I got in trouble for was I said a bar was closing when it wasn't. And in my defense, the man who owned the bars had many bars with very similar names yeah. that all had the word zone in them or doc. And so he was closing one of them and I said a different one of them was closing. Um, we corrected it the very next week in the paper, gave him free ads. And, um, but he was adamant about like that this, this really killed his business or whatever. But, but what? The fact that his business was really crowded the next week when we announced, oh no, it's not closing. It was a mistake, but everybody went there because they thought it was the last week it was going to be open. Um, but anyway, that was one of the things I got in trouble for. And I got in trouble for a few restaurant premieres that um, one of them was just this horrific restaurant. And well, the, uh, at Gay Chicago, when I was writing there, and Ralph Paul refused to run it because they were an advertiser. And uh, yeah. we had a big fight about that. Uh, but the restaurant was closed down by the Board of Health the next week. And so we are right in your reopen. So <laughs> I was justified in what I was saying about it. Well, I think uh, when we when we reference sort of the volatile history of um, Chicago's LGBTQ press, I think it maybe if you could give like a quick synopsis of how gay Chicago went to Windy City, went to Outlines, went to sure. uh, the whole migration. Right. Well, Gay Life was the first regularly published gay and lesbian publication in Chicago. There were other ones before it, but they weren't on a regular basis, a weekly basis. Gay Life was the first one. Gay Life was owned by, founded and run by Grant Ford, who is this, was this wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, he was active in politics as well. And as a matter of fact, when he, at one point, he decided to run for alderman, I believe. And so he had to divest himself of gay life. So Chuck Renslow, a local businessman, took it over and managed it while he was running his campaign. He ended up not winning. I don't even think he finished the campaign, but um, realized afterwards that he was not interested in the day-to-day -day machinations of running a newspaper. He, you know, he kind of viewed it as a community service. Mm -hmm. And it was becoming much more than that. It was a business. And Chuck Renzel was a businessman. And he felt that not only could he run it as a business, but that it could be a community service as well. So Chuck took over gay life. Um, while it was running, Jeff McCourt, who had been a commodities trader, came in and said, I really want to learn the news industry. I'd like to write for you. So he was writing theater reviews. And then he said, I'd really like to learn about buying. I'm thinking I'd like to buy the paper from you. Would you be interested in selling? And Chuck was like, sure. He goes, well, how about if I work for you for a year and learn it, and then we can, I'll buy it from you. So he worked for him for a while and realized that the only thing of value that the paper really had was its name and its client list of advertisers mm -hmm. and the staff. And Jeff said, why should I pay for this? I can just take them and leave. So he went and he, in the night before, I believe it was the pride issue, the week before, they, he and three other staffers left and just took everything with them and started putting together their own paper that was going to debut on Pride Day. And Renslow, since he was not hands-on operational, 
didn't realize what was going on until like three days before Pride, he said, I have no newspaper to print. What happened? And so uh, that's how Windy City Times was born. So they kind of <laughs> pirated from gay life. He took some of the staffers, including Tracy Bain and uh, their, their ad salesperson and their art director and created his own newspaper. And Jeff was, if nothing else, a brilliant businessman. He is the man that came up with the idea of niche marketing to the gay community. And he approached Marshall Fields, major, major retailers, uh, car dealerships to advertise in Windy City Times, which as you will notice, did not have the word gay in its title, even though it was an LGBT paper. The word gay wasn't there. So they could write checks to buy ads and the word gay would not appear which was a strategic move on his part. Um, so anyway, he, he started the paper. Within a few months, Gay Life was out of business. Windy City Times was a juggernaut that could not stop. And they had taken everything of value with them. So uh, eventually Chuck Renslow folded Gay Life Windy City Times was there. Um, Jeff had substance abuse problems and was a very volatile personality. And eventually the people that worked for him got tired of dealing with that. So the first one to leave was Tracy Bain who left and started Outlines and eventually then Nightlines Black Lines and La Vida, all of her specialty papers. Um, and she started that. And of course, Jeff badmouthed it as it's a lesbian paper, only lesbians read it. So she had trouble getting advertisers. There was a lot of bad blood. Um, but Jeff hired all new staff members. So when you say Times was going strong, Tracy, to her credit, was steadily building outlines now, night lines into a very strong publication. She's an incredible journalist and assembled a good team. Um, what happened then was the people that Jeff hired to replace Tracy and some of the other people that left got fed up with him and they left and went started Chicago Free Press, which was another competing newspaper. So all of this was going on. In the meantime, Gay Chicago Magazine, they were all newspapers. Gay mm -hmm. Chicago Magazine was an entertainment guy. So that was, they were never really in direct competition and never tried to be. Mm -hmm. So um, they were kind of off to the side during the fray of these three juggernauts going at each other. But in the meantime, they were getting all of this advertising from the phone sex ads and things and building up and becoming, it basically started out as, okay, on Monday night, the, this bar is doing that special, this bar is doing that special. I started as just doing restaurant reviews and cooking columns. And then I started writing like a little gossipy column. And then we, I, push them to become more of an advertising, more of an entertainment guide, mm -hmm. not just the bars to expand mm -hmm. beyond it. And eventually what they did is they, we created a whole section called After Dark, which was their entertainment guide. So it was theater and movie reviews and book reviews. And because they had so much money, I had a staff of like 12 people that worked for me putting these things together. And we became, one of the leading entertainment guides in the city, not not just gay or not just gay, in the city overall. Mm -hmm. um, and the After Dark Awards, which we gave out to theater companies, became very sought after and very prestigious. Um, so all of that was going on, and then um, the publishers of Gay Chicago, 
Dan DeLeo and Ralph Paul. Dan DeLeo died and Ralph, Ralph Paul was left. Well, actually before that happened, there was the whole thing with Danny Sotomayor, which I said I wasn't gonna bring up, but I just did, um, where they would not run one of his political ads because it made a former employee of theirs look bad. So Danny ended up going to write for Windy City Times, who is his uh, cartoons for Windy City Times and eventually I believe outlines as well, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, but so there was there was kind of a little fallout there between the, the, the groups and then Late, much later, after Dan DeLeo died, um, and Ralph Paul was getting quite up there in age, um, one of their top ad salesmen went off and started his own magazine. Two of their ad salesmen started, which is still around, Grab, mm -hmm. uh, Stacy and Mark Nagel. So they started Grab Magazine, which was a little bit more uh, purient in its focus um, than Chicago was. And they had a very good niche market there and they were going well. So all of that was going on. And then in the meantime, Chicago Pride website developed as well. So that's, and then Chicago Free Press imploded because its, its publisher was, was also substance abuse problems and it, that paper just crashed and burned after a while. So, and then uh, Mike Macharello, who had written for Gay Chicago, started Boy Magazine, which was a bar guide basically, and club. It was basically mm -hmm. club kids. And then he wanted to expand that more, and so he tried to get me to come on as editor for quite a while. And I was like, you know. I'm 50 years old. I have no interest in going to club kid events. <laughs> but you don't have to. I just want you to bring in the other content. <laughs> so we did that for a while. Um, and that, that ran. And I think he's still doing it online to some extent. That is quite a volatile story. <laughs> that explains yes, volatility right there. And there's no <laughs> short way to tell it. There is, well, and it's, it's, it's exactly. It's really compelling, and it's uh, with so many different, uh, so many different changes and evolutions. Um, something I always admired about your work, and especially because you were so much in the public eye, was that you used it a lot um, to do some really great uh, community things, like um, cruising for a dream and a commitment to love. Which was a commitment to love was the first. Was it the first same sex? Right, game? first first same sex wedding expo. Wedding expo, yes. Yeah. But, and you also were the uh, the start of Night of One Hundred uh, Drag Queens, and I really want to hear about that. Uh, tell me about how um, that fundraiser started. Well, it started as my birthday party. <laughs> um, many things do. Ba ba basically, I I had just bought a house, and I was like. You know, the things I need for, for my birthday are drywall and, you know, drywall mud and, and flooring, and no one's going to buy that for my birthday. So instead, and I'm going to take these off so you can see the camera. Um, oops. There. Um, so I said to everybody if you were going to buy a card or a gift or anything, just put that money in a jar that we'll put on the bar. And we'll donate it. And I was donating it to the gay and lesbian parents group that year. And I mean, we raised probably five or six hundred dollars. And basically, I went to Sidetrack. I told them what I wanted to do. I said, "Can I have like this little corner of the bar where I hang out every every Monday for show tunes?" And they were like, "Yeah." So, you know, and I brought a cake. I said, "Can I bring in a cake?" So I brought a cake. And I bought a couple, a case of cheap champagne from them. <laughs> and basically that was my birthday party. And they arranged to have two drag performers come over. So they put 
beer cases on the ground and put a ply piece of plywood on it for a stage. And there were two drag queens, Vicki Spike and Paula Sinclair, got up and did a, num a couple numbers. And that was how it started. The next year, there were a few more numbers and we did a little bit more. And then it eventually evolved into where I would, I would make it, we moved it to Sunday afternoons when they had show tunes on Sunday afternoons and we would have a buffet. And then there were like, at one point there were like 12 performers. And I said to Chuck Hyde at the time, uh, the manager of Sidetrack that I really wanted one always wanted to do an, an event called Night of a Hundred Drag Queens because there was this TV show called Night of a Hundred Stars that was basically stars walking across the stage in an evening gown. <laughs> it show. And it would just say, "Who here? here's Rita Moreno in Galliano <laughs> walk across the stage and that was it. So I thought, well, if they can do that, we can make the thing. So we did it. And we, they actually built a stage on the bar and there were, I think maybe 30 performers that did numbers throughout the night. And the staff was all done up in drag and Sidetrack didn't do drag a lot. So it was kind of a special thing for them. And it just sort of grew from there and to the point where near the end, they had two nights, two stages, video running constantly so that no matter where you were in the bar you saw the performer who was performing um and over the years it's raised millions of dollars for various mm -hmm. charities oh, yeah. uh, and a lot of that 99 percent of that is the credit of sidetrack uh for getting liquor companies to sponsor it and underwrite it and, and you know, then then we started charging a cover and for people to come in. So we made some good some good coin for charity over the years. But um, and it got to the point where I mean, for the first probably 15 years, I would work on it with them and I'd be like a producer, director type thing. And then after that, it grew beyond what I could handle. And I would just be a guest performer. And I always said I was a dog act if I hadn't started the event. <laughs> I uh, they kind of had to let me in no matter how bad I was you know well I'm sure people are going to have a lot of questions for you so I'll just end with one more one last one I want in three words a description of your little affair with Vito Russo um <laughs> oh my goodness three well words. I I think I can I can Sum it up in a in a song from Dream Girls, One Night Only. <laughs> he was in town at Unabridged promoting his book. Um, since I was the entertainment editor of Gay Chicago, I had been talking with him about stuff, you sure. know, how to promote it and stuff. And um he we ended up spending the night together, and that that was about it. That's so. awesome. And, and Vito Russo, by the way, is um, the author and speaker of the celluloid closet. People right. So, and, and a very and, sweet man. Very, very sweet. Very sweet man. He was very sweet. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm sure. curious to hear what people have to ask you. Oh, I have to add one thing. That one night only was way before I met my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yes. I, I was single then. Yes. It's good, good point of clarification. No, that's, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Owen and uh, and Rick. So we've we've got quite a few questions people have typed over. So I'll start reading over um, questions, and then if you want to type more questions, just send them to Gerberhart, Jen, and Tell. If you prefer to ask them yourself, you can virtually raise your hand to do that, and there's instructions in the chat for how to do that. Um, but our first question is from Steve Hickson. Uh, and it's what do you consider to be the most important way the gay press can adapt for the future? Oh, well, it's all, it's all internet based now. And um, I think the most important thing is to be as professional as possible. There is a, um, a tendency for online people, contributors to n not be paid and not be qualified 
and it's up to the pro the provider of whatever their outlet is to really vet them and make sure that things are done properly. Um, there's a, a lack of accountability in a lot of things and a lot of errors that are made because nobody's checking. They don't have fact checkers anymore. They don't have proofreaders anymore. And um, so I think that that, if the gay press is going to survive, that's one of the things it has to do. Great. And then we have a question from uh, John D'Amelio. So he says, in the 80s and early 90s, even though your work was in Chicago and Chicago-based, did you have any sense of there being a larger community or network of LGBTQ journalists around the country? Oh, sure, sure. Whenever, um, you know, there, there were there were beginnings of the networking that is more prevalent and more more organized now. Um, there, as a matter of fact, um, it was I think Windy City Times and Philadelphia Gay News and Bay Windows and Bay Area Reporter were the genesis of the Gay and Lesbian Press Association. So um, yeah, there were definitely was. And when I would go to other cities, I would definitely visit with other press, and they would they would sometimes run things that I had done in Chicago that were you know more relevant that nationally relevant, and so we would share things back and forth. Yeah. Great. Um, and then we have a question from Diane Poland, which is Rick, how has the vision of the press's mission changed over the years? Well, I think it's expanded. Um, you know, our our idea of what is community is um, a lot more inclusive now than it was. You know, people when people said gay and lesbian press, it was basically white men, you know, of a certain age in their at that time in their twenties and thirties, and now we have a much more diverse set of voices, which I think is incredibly uh, wonderful and helpful um, for, for getting the vision across. It still is too predominantly, it's too dominated by, you know, white male voices, but we're getting better. So we have a, a question from Robert Castillo um, who says, uh, were you writing for the queer press while you were teaching? And did you fear being out uh, in the work for the queer press jeopardizing you in the classroom? At the very beginning I was, but very soon after I started, I was, I was too stupid to realize that at first, well, I started writing before I was teaching. So it didn't really matter then and then when I started teaching it was too late because my name was already out there and I was a little too naive to realize that it could cause problems and then very soon after I started at Gay Chicago um, the Chicago Teachers Union and the city and the Chicago Board of Education all passed non-discrimination policies so I did have a couple parents who tried to cause issues. Um, one saw me at the pride parade and tried to make a big stink and got a, a bunch of, and I taught little kids, I taught second graders. So uh, at that time, so um, she tried to make a big stink out of it. And the parents were like, we don't care, he's a good teacher. So that was, uh, you know, that was kind of the response that she got. Oh, so you, you were there too. So um, yes. but, um, let's see. So we got an email question. So this is from Dana Shapiro Spaith. Um, your husband's also a writer. Do you help each other with editing? And are you both brutally honest with each other if you really don't like something the other has written? Um, and then she also has a, a nice comment. Um, my husband and I have both really enjoyed your book and learning more about you and your life. You're very courageous. Your students who were in your plays were so lucky to have had you. Oh. Thank you. Um, that is my sister-in-law. So, um, 
I'm very lucky to have married into a wonderful family. I have to say that. Um, yes, my husband and I do proofread each other's work on a regular basis um, and edit as offer editorial advice. Um, he, well, for example, with paper cuts, he was the one that told me it should not be a memoir. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be fiction. It should be a memoir. And then when I was finished with it, he said, you know, maybe this should be fiction. I wanted to kill him after, after I did that. But, um, but otherwise, yeah, and we, we were pretty good about taking criticism from each other. Um, yeah, it, we have no problem with it. I, I, I respect his, his opinion and he respects me as an editor. So I'm a, I'm a much better editor than I am writer, I think. And so uh, I, I think I add a lot to what he writes um, and help him with that. Except poetry, because I don't understand it. So <laughs> that I don't, I don't help with. I, I read it, but I don't understand it. So. That's fair. Um, all right, so we've got a question from Gerald Cole, or it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice comment. So I came to Chicago in 1979 to go to college. We walked many of the same paths in the city and this book has really brought out a lot of fond memories in a very vivid manner. And then um, we've got a question from Greg Shapiro. Uh, <laughs> so if Paper Cuts was made into a movie, who would you want to play you on screen? Ewan McGregor. <laughs> Perfect. Not Will Riker? <laughs> no, I. Th we should tell them. I there's a picture of me that you were running in a promo, and you said I look like uh, Will Riker from Star Trek: The Next Generation, and I used to get that all the time when it was on because I did look a lot like him. I had the same beard and everything. Yes, I yes. I would there. like. I would like to be played by you and McGregor, and Army Hammer will play my husband. All right, and then let's see, we've got uh, emailed questions. We've got two emailed questions from Grant Stewart. Um, so the first was, what was the most memorable machination or backstab from your gay life days? Um, and then the second was, what year did Night of 100 Drag Queens begin? And if there's a winner every year and a memorable queen? Um, I'm gonna do the second one first while I think about the machinations one. Um, I don't remember what year it started. Nobody could remember. I think it was my 30th birthday, which would have made it 1983. Um, but I'm not sure about that. Cause we just, at one point we just said, cause we had had so many shows before that we just started with like Night of 100 Drag Queen seven. We just guessed that there were seven before it or whatever. So, uh, but it did go up to like 25, I think. I have Andrew Drag Queens 25. Um, and then they did, they changed the name of it for a year and then COVID hit. So they didn't do it last year. Um, there, there was not a winner, it was not like a contest, but two of the ones that, that stick out in my mind is we had a deaf, participant who I still to this day don't understand how he was able to lip sync so perfectly since he was deaf. Um, he tried explaining it to me and it had something to do with he could feel the rhythms of the beats but that was and and watching the performer lips and reading their lips. So that was that was one I was just so impressed with him, um, and there were a, quite a few that were. It was for many people it was their first time in drag, and to see how someone could blossom and change, and be so different, that would one. And probably my favorite is um, my former roommate uh, Calvin Harris who now lives in Las Vegas, uh, who is my son's official, unofficial godmother. Um, Calvin and I got dressed up as nuns 
and did Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, the Annie Lennox, uh, Aretha Franklin song. And when there's, um, no, I'm sorry, we didn't, we didn't do that when we did the Sisters from the Danny Kaye, Bing Crosby movie. Um, and when it said, when a certain gentleman from Rome came, the picture of the Pope came down. So that was, that was one of my favorites. Um, so that was that. As far as the backstabbing, oh my goodness. Um, I think the, the biggest backstabbing thing has got to be when Jeff McCourt and Tracy Baim and Drew and Robert walked out and just started Windy City Times. That was, that was like a jaw dropping moment. So. Let's see, so we've still got, we've got quite a few. Um, let's see, so we've got one from Michael Burke. Uh, so I loved the book, the personal story, the history, the look inside a fascinating piece of our community's life. Two questions. The first is perfect title and subtitle. Was the book always called Paper Cuts, My Life in Chicago's Volatile LGBTQ Press? And two, do you have a sense of how Chicago's LGBTQ press compared to the press, the, the LGBTQ press in other cities? Um, it was always going to be called Paper Cuts. I just, I love that title. Uh, the, the subtitle was added later um, just because I felt it needed to be, have, it needed something else. Paper Cuts was not enough. Um, so that was that. Um, as far as other, as other cities being like, it was not like that in other cities because other cities did not have the number of newspapers Chicago had. I mean, Chicago has always been a newspaper town. I, when doing research for the book at one point, there were 45 different daily papers in Chicago, you know, foreign language papers, things like that. Um, and a great number of weekly papers. So Chicago has always been a newspaper town, much more so than like San Francisco or LA, New York even doesn't even come close. Um, and so we always had more gay publications as well. So I don't I don't think there was the the opportunity for the infighting or the or the uh, kind of rivalries that went on because they were all struggling for survival on their own mostly. That definitely makes sense. Um, let's see, we have another emailed question. And again, if you have questions, please type them in the chat or if you want to ask them live, just virtually raise your hand and we'll get to those next. Uh, so this is from Scott Vanderweel. So do you think the current gay press is substantially more conservative than it was when you started out? Oh yes. Yeah, people are much more, first of all, they're much more concerned about being sued. And they are businesses now. They're not being run by a bunch of anarchists who, you know, have nothing, have nothing between them to lose. So, you know, there there definitely is, and it's much more corporate. So yeah, it's definitely more more conservative in its approach to things. And I think. I don't know if you could say it was more, they're more conservative politically because America has really moved, even though there's a lot of on the, the right, has moved to the left a lot as far as politics and things. I mean, when you consider that mainstream marriage and, you know, gay men are shown in Hallmark commercials and things, we've progressed to a point where what was considered radical is now more mainstream. So I don't know if you can really say they're more conservative or whether the mainstream is caught up to us. Let's see, so we have our first live question. Um, so Steve, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. So we have a question from your, your former co-editor at Gay Life, Steve Kalecki. Ah, uh, Steve. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. 
Hey, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited that Rick and I are both here um, 42 years later. And I got to tell you, Rick's column 42 years ago this June did make me chuckle. And he, Rick, you still laugh and delight me today. And I loved your book. Um, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I guess one, thing, one of my experiences was I've looked back at what I wrote at Gay Life 40 years ago. Do you ever have this experience where you look back at, at a column or something you wrote and you have no memory of writing it or it just shocks you what you say? I mean, I've had that experience. Um, and I guess, secondly, what I want to put in perspective, and I think Owen did a nice job, too, of, um, about the real history of how the uh, LGBT press has progressed. Tell us about that time. And I know it was so exciting. You'd write a column and two days later, a couple of days later, there was a newsprint on, on cigarette machines and bars all over town. You know, there was something about that that was very like front page, like you said. That So so first off then, surprise to look back at your own writing and then talk about that time in a newsprint and you pick it up in the bar and you'd look down the bar and see people reading what you wrote. Oh, well, that was, that was pretty amazing. Um... I know that there are time, there are columns I've, I, I went, I went through the archives of Suki de la Croix uh, and looked up a lot of my old columns and things because he has everything wow. where he did before he moved to California. I don't know if he took it all with him, probably did. Um, but I went through and I would read things and I'm like, God, I don't remember that restaurant <laughs> at all. I don't remember this, I, you know. Who would the hell was I talking about in this blind item I'm writing? You know, so that, yeah, a lot of that's gone. And I don't think that has to do with age. A lot of it has to do with, it really wasn't that important at the time. But, you know, my job was to make the unimportant seem important with the gossip column. So that was one point of it. Um, and then the other part was, you know, seeing seeing your name. I, I remember the first time I saw my column in a new in print. I was like practically running down the street showing it to strangers. I was so excited. Um, and I don't know about you, but I never grew up wanting to be a writer. It wasn't one of those things where I had this great urge to be a writer. I, you know, and if I did, I thought I'd be the next Jacqueline Suzanne. <laughs> Not really, you know, a journalist of any kind. Um, so yeah, you know, that's why I always say I didn't write real news. You you were a newsman. I was I was an entertainment writer, um, and that's so that that's part of the difference too. Is is seeing getting getting to see that I never expected it. And the best part was when I would when it was the gossip column, and people would be writing talking about it and talking about me. And I'd be sitting right next to him in the right. box. And I remember somebody said, oh, she is such a bitch. I'm good <laughs> at her. And he's nasty to everybody. And he said, and I just turned and looked. I said, oh, you know him? And they're like, yes. And I said, well, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm him. <laughs> and I might have been a bitch, but I, they didn't know me. <laughs> right. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you again. You were so supportive at the beginning of, of my writing um, career. I, I owe it all to you and Grant and Sarah. Yeah, I know. Bo both of them terrific and not with us. Grant and Sarah are, are with us yeah. today. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, let's look at, we've got one more question. So if you, have, if you have more questions, send them over. We did get an email. Uh, I think people want to see a photo of you as a nun. So if you do have that, uh, we can post it on Facebook and Instagram if, if you have a photo of you as a nun. <laughs> I can pull it out and hold it up. It's not far away. I mean, go ahead and ask the question. I'll slide over and get it. Perfect. Um, and then, Owen, if you have other questions too, I'll, I'll read. We have one more question from um, Robert Castillo. Uh, so it's What gay writer or book impacted you the most? Um, but yeah, let's see the, the nun photo too. <laughs> um, well, there are two that I would say that impacted me heavily. One is um, Michael Bronsky, who wrote Culture Clash, 
um, about the gay influence uh, in mainstream entertainment culture. Um, and then the other would be Armistead Maupin, his Tales of the City book, were something I truly, truly loved. Um, and I actually wrote kind of an homage to it called Tales of the Second City that we serialized in Gay Chicago. So those are the two, I would say. And let's see if we can get this. There. Try holding it up a little higher. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't think it's showing up on the screen, though. I don't see it. Either. Does it's, anybody else see it? It's a little small. If you lift it up a little more. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Well, if you if you want to email that, I could I could always post that on our, our yeah. Facebook too. Oh, that one shows up better. Yes. Nothing Perfect. like a like a nun with long red fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I don't. Do you? I, I have one question. Then I don't know, Owen, if you have other questions. But just if you if you could think of, is there a person that you interviewed or something that sticks out the most that was you know the the favorite thing that you worked on when you were in Chicago in the press? Well, I think I think probably one of one of the most my my greatest memories is I got to meet Bette Midler for a split second, um, and I was so dumbfounded. I, all I could think to her to say to her was, "You're really good." I did not expect to meet her. I turned around, and there she was. So that that was one because she's an idol of mine. Um, both for her politics and and her talent. Um, so that would be one of the ones. Um, I think I think the um, founding the After Dark Awards for through Gray Chicago for for excellence in Chicago theater was probably the thing I'm most proud of that I did in all those years there. That's great. I don't know. Do, Owen, do you have any other questions or? Oh, you're, you're muted. I'm asking you to. Uh. A lot of times um, when people write memoirs, they can be uh, very therapeutic. Um, I'm wondering if, if writing your story really caused you to sort of uh, free or confront any demons or anything in the past? Um, it, it caused me to let go of a lot of anger. Because mm -hmm. um, I was fired. I, did, I didn't mention this. I was fired from Gay Chicago um, over something. And uh, I had a lot of anger on that for a long time. And it helped me to release that anger. Sure. Because uh, I wrote for them for 14 years. So it was almost like losing a family, you know. Um, and it happened very suddenly and I was very surprised and it was not for anything I would have thought it would have happened for. So mm -hmm. um, that was, and it took me a while to end, get back on my feet after that. But um, yeah, so that was, and I write about, I wrote about it in the book and writing about it allowed me not to see some of the participants in it as villains. Mm -hmm. um, and as I had been picturing them. So that was, that was um, one thing that came out of it. Okay, I was just curious, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And thank you so much for this incredible time capsule. Um, like you said in the intro, it's so important to get these stories down because especially a firsthand account like this, it's really amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, I hope that Tracy writes her biography because she's got quite a story to tell. Um, 
And there are a few other people that should be writing one too. And Bill Williams, if you're listening, you're one of those people that should be writing one because he's he wrote for Windy City Times numerous times and he's got a lot to add too. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for coming tonight and thank you, Rick and Owen too. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.